I think so. so yeah. All right. So let's continue with our morning session uh, with the second lecture from Leon. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so so last time I um, I uh, described the uh, physics of uh, topological insulators protected by uh, crystal symmetry. Uh, so these uh, I explained the tin terawatt class of these topological crystalline insulators. So um, today I will I'll, um, uh, finish up uh, this part of the uh, lecture and then uh, move on to uh, the, the next parts, which is perhaps more uh, interesting for this school. So um, at the end of the uh, lecture last time, I described I briefly sketched the layer construction of 3D topological crystal insulators uh, as a theoretical uh, device uh, to, to uh, help us think about uh, the, uh, the the very very basic properties of these systems. So um, so uh, let me just give examples here. So if we think about the uh, topological crystal insulator protected by uh, cr mirror symmetry, reflection symmetry, such as tin terawatt, uh, even though the uh, crystal of tin terawatt is cubic. Uh, at the fundamental level, uh, this uh, material is topologically equivalent to a following system, which is just a stack of uh, two-dimensional uh, quantum Hall states. Okay, and uh, so if I just take a decoupled array of two D uh, integer quantum Hall states, where each uh, so right now I'm looking uh, so each plane sort of goes this way, so I'm looking at the edge of each plane. Every line represents the edge of a plane that goes. Uh, into the black ball. And uh, so if I have a, this particular uh, alternating array of nu equal 1 and nu equal minus 1 uh, quantum Hall uh, systems stacked in this x direction, and now we are looking at the side surface of this stack. Uh, as a 3D system, we are looking at the surface of this. Um, so how do I um, convince you that uh, this kind of a, a decoupled stacks is actually topologically equivalent to the surface states? of a 3D topological crystal insider with mirror symmetry. Well, let's look at uh, the uh, dispersion of surface states obtained from all these uh, one-dimensional chiral edge states. So the uh, J here labels uh, each of these uh, edges. Uh, and for each edge, there's a chiral edge state. So there should be minus 1 to the J so that we have a staggered chirality here. right? Um, so this will be the leading term. And now I can turn on some very weak tunneling between these uh, edges. Okay? And I can turn on this perturbation only on the edge, not in the bulk. Right? Now, uh, if, in revert, uh, if this reflection symmetry with respect to x equals 0, x go to minus x, is absent, then there's no reason that the tunneling to the left uh, and tunneling to the right are equal. Uh, so generally, they are unequal. And when they are unequal, the stronger one will basically dominates. And we have basically a, a dimerized uh, set of uh, quantum Hall bilayers. And uh, this dimerization basically uh, couples counterpropagating edge states and uh, uh, gap them out. So in this case, without reflection symmetry, the dimerization completely gaps the surface. So there's nothing interesting left on the surface. But when in, uh, this reflection symmetry is present, uh, then the tunneling to the left and the right are equal. And one can solve this problem explicitly. And uh, you will see that uh, in momentum space, as a function of both ky and kx, uh, we get a two-dimensional Dirac cone. Okay. And this is exactly what you expect from the mirror Chen number uh, that I described in the first lecture. When the mirror Chen number is non-zero, there has to be Dirac cone on the surface. Okay. In this case, you get a one Dirac cone because I'm looking at a case where mirror Chen number is equal to one. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, yes, question? Yeah, about x equals 0 or, or any of these planes. It has to be at planes, uh, not, not between the planes. Because this system does, does not have reflection symmetry uh, in between two planes. So this system only have this construction. Uh, it only gives you mirror symmetry with respect to uh, each of these planes, not in the middle of two planes. By construction, yeah, by construction, yeah. But in general, in the, even in the crystal, there are well-defined mirror planes. Right? We cannot choose an arbitrary uh, mirror plane. But for a given crystal, there are certain uh, sets of mirror planes at well-defined locations. Yeah. Is the crystal point of isosage? I'm sorry? Oh, it should be staggered. 
it should be staggered. There should be minus one to the j. So, so let me, yeah, rules. So what's the edge? This is the edge of the quantum model. This is, yeah, each each line is the edge of a, you know. If you look at the planes are extending this way, and we are looking in this direction. So each line represents the edge of the quantum power state. And the first term should be uh, should be this. So, so, so there's this factor here. Yeah. You've also been emphasizing mirror symmetry. Yeah. I mean, there's much more different. Oh, you mean there are other symmetries? There's other symmetries. Yeah. So oh, you mean for? Like richness just explodes, or like what? So why, why is this? So I, I'm, like I'm focusing on the particular class of topological crystallines that are protected by mirror symmetry for now. Later, I'll say a few words about one other symmetry class where similar construction also works. And this is sort of the minimal. This is a minimal. This is minimal, exactly. So this, this, this construction gives you a 3D TCI with mirror to number equal 1. So then I can take identical copies of that. So then I get mirror to number n. Yeah, so that's excellent. Yeah, great. So, um, so from this uh, construction, you see very explicitly that. Um, that the role of mirror symmetry is to force, to enforce that this surface is right at the critical point between two uh, opposite dimerization patterns, right? So I can have strong, weak, strong, weak, and this is one dimerization pattern, or I can have weak, strong, weak, strong. And these two different dimerization patterns both give you um, fully gapped surfaces, but they differ uh, by having a turn number different by one. Because if I have a domain wall between these two different dimerization patterns, I will have one chiral edge states, right? So uh, basically, um, just to summarize again, that the reflection symmetry basically enforces the surface to be right at the critical point that's equivalent to the quantum Hall plateau transition, where the uh, Hall conductance change by one. Okay, so gapping the surface requires breaking mirror symmetry, and two ways of gapping these uh, surfaces, uh, in this case, two dimerization patterns, they lead to quantum Hall states that differ by uh, chain number one. The uh, quantum Hall states you can think of as chain number uh, being one half and minus half. Okay, and with this construction, uh, uh, one can uh, generalize to in interacting systems. This is something that uh, with my Kermelis group uh, student uh, uh, Song Hao uh, and uh, Huang Yi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All, right. All, right. All right. Anyway, yeah, yeah. We we, we explored uh, some of the systems for the interacting case. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry? No. But this is uh, each, um, each, uh, so here, each uh, each system is a one dimensional, right? Yeah, I said, yeah. Yeah, but the important thing is that uh, each line here is a one dimensional system. So we have a uh, coupled um, one dimensional systems, whereas SHH model is uh, coupled sites. No, I understand. I'm saying it's much more. It's analogous, of course, of course. It's like a critical point. It's a critical point of SSH, yeah. The weird thing is that the SSH, the reflection center, is always in between. Here you take your reflection center on. Yeah, so the thing that the SSH doesn't have is that here I have an alternating chirality. Right? In SSH model, every side are equivalent. Well, SSH, the analogous thing is that you have one side separated by different lines. OK, yeah, but then. But yeah, you can. Also, but then in that case, you don't get. Uh, I don't think you get. Uh, you, you don't get it because your yeah. reflection symmetry now is uh, it's a bit weird. It's not in between the two subletters, but it's actually on one of them. Yeah, so I think this is not. not it's not. It's definitely not the same as SSH. This yeah. this is, this physics is beyond SSH. In other words, also you know you don't get two D Dracoin SSH model. It's a one dimensional model. So this, here I'm talking about two dimensional model that is built out of an array of one dimensional. Okay, yeah. Okay, so all right, so um, so now we can uh, uh, do a bit a, a bit more. Uh, so uh, let me uh, no, we know tin terawatt actually has uh, mirror to number two instead of mirror to number one, and also tin terawatt has uh, exact time reversal symmetry, right? So um, so 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 then uh, whereas you know the previous construction that I've described here, uh, time reversal symmetry is broken because each plane has a well-defined chirality. So uh, one can do a, a little bit uh, better. So now imagine that I uh, take a stack of uh, two-dimensional uh, quantum spin hall inserters. Again, 
each line represents the edge of a 2D time reversal invariant topological integer. Right? And uh, if I have a translation invariant stack, we know that uh, we get a so-called three-dimensional weak topological integer. Um, uh, and, and that is a phase protected by translational symmetry. Uh, if we take an alternating stack, just imagine that uh, uh, every plane, every other plane, are just slightly different. I add some unimportant perturbation, uh, just that the whole system does not have translation symmetry by one uh, lattice constant. So now each unit cell contains two layers. So then uh, this uh, system is tr uh, trivial in the sense of uh, Z2 topological index uh, because, uh, because, you know, I can just uh, dimerize uh, these two planes within the new cell in the absence of other symmetries, and that will completely get rid of these uh, edge states. Right? But again, uh, if reflection symmetry is present, uh, it is guaranteed that uh, uh, tunneling to the left and to the right are equal, and then one can also work out the system. Uh, you know, the only difference from previous one is that now, now each uh, edge here consists of both spin up and spin down states, and they uh, are counter propagating. Okay. So uh, adding these uh, uh, inter-edge tunnelings in a symmetric way, guaranteed by reflection symmetry, then it will generate a Kramer's pair of drag cones. Uh, and these, uh, you know, if we add all symmetry allowed uh, perturbations, you will see that these um, Kramer pair of drag cones are actually located away from the uh, k equals zero points, just like the surface states of 10 terawatt. Yes? They would have, uh, they're located at the opposite momentum, uh, and uh, I think they have the same helicity. You know, the way you can define helicity is the spin momentum locking. Right? And in this construction, uh, uh, I have two-fold rotation symmetry. So then it's guaranteed they have the same helicity. Yeah. But generally, the helicity is a very subtle concept. It requires some, you know, defining in a proper way. Anyway. All right. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So, uh, you know, I, I put in this, uh, this da 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 here. So, uh, so this term is uh, spin preserving couplings, but there are additional uh, spin flipping tunnelings as long as they satisfy uh, time reversal and they satisfy this reflection symmetry. They are allowed to be present. So, um, one can uh, add all these perturbations, something I, I, I checked, that, uh, um, that, that you will find that you, you get a pair of drag cones that are away from the k equals zero point. Okay, so um, all right, so this is uh, basically layer construction of the 3D TCIs. We see that this is basically a complementary approach than the uh, momentum space, you know, trend number uh, uh, type of uh, topological index. Um, of course, uh, the, uh, well, I should point out that even theoretically speaking, uh, these kind of uh, topological crystalline phases with mirror symmetry are equivalent to these uh, essentially decoupled layers. Uh, of course, the challenge is that in real materials, um, these materials are not. You know, tin terra itself is a very cubic material. Even though it's topologically equivalent to stacking of planes in all different directions, uh, you, know, you wouldn't call tin terra a, a layer 2D material in any uh, reasonable sense. OK, um, okay then, uh, uh, so right now I've described two classes uh, of uh, mirror symmetric topological crystal inserts uh, without any additional symmetry or with uh, time reversal symmetry. Uh, so one can actually. Uh, generalize this to all the 10 different symmetry classes uh, in the uh, so-called uh, uh, bot periodicity uh, table. The idea is that with every internal symmetry that you have heard about uh, in the previous lectures, we can add additional uh, mirror symmetry. And the mirror symmetry can either commute or anti-commute with some of these internal symmetries. And this leads to uh, a, a big table of uh, mirror symmetric topological insiders and topological supernatures. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to explain this, but you can read it in this uh, review article. And uh, they also have a lot of uh, references there. Okay. Um, so one last uh, topic uh, in this uh, uh, area is uh, non-symorphic uh, topological uh, insiders. Uh, yes? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, in the two examples I'm describing today, those with reflection symmetry and with those with so-called glide reflection symmetry, they are both, uh, the statement is true. But I don't think it's true in general. In fact, I, I think it's not true in general. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's not true in general. Yeah. No, we, we have count examples, yeah. Yeah, I can, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, so I think what, yeah, okay, all right, yeah. Okay, so, um, 
mean, let me actually let me be, be precise. I, I do think that uh, uh, these topological crystallizers, at least within the non-interacting classification, uh, all um, can be constructed in some way from uh, lower dimensional uh, topological insiders. Okay? But it does not necessarily have to be uh, layer constructions. It could be more sophisticated types of constructions. I mean, let me put it this way. Yeah. All right. And, the, uh, and, and speaking of interacting cases, we know less, much less about. Let me put it this way. Yeah. All right. All right. So, um, OK, so, um, so the kind of symmetry that I've described, reflection symmetry, uh, is an example of so-called point group symmetry. It preserves, uh, keeps a, a center of operation uh, uh, same. Uh, but there are also so-called non-symorphic uh, uh, symmetries. And these are basically a combination of uh, point group symmetry with uh, some fraction of a translation. So one example is here. So if you have this uh, one-dimensional system consists of two legs that are offset uh, from each other, then uh, there's one, one symmetry which is uh, which th th there's full translation uh, by one lattice constant, but there's additional symmetry which is translating by half a lattice constant and followed by reflection y to minus y. Okay, so this is an example of so-called uh, uh, glide reflection, a combination of uh, half translation in the x direction followed by reflection in the y direction. Um, so it has been known for quite some time that well, this kind of non-symorphic symmetry uh, leads to very interesting uh, features uh, in the band structure. And uh, let me describe it here. So, um, so uh, as we know that uh, in band theory, uh, the energy eigenstates uh, can be classified as uh, can, can 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 also be chosen to be um, eigenstates of the symmetry operations. For example, when there's a mirror symmetry, uh, all the um, bands as a function of momentum k can be chosen to be uh, mirror eigenstates with mirror eigenvalue plus or minus. Okay, for spin one half system, it should be plus i and minus i. Um, so the same happens for glide symmetry. But the eigenvalues of the glide reflection uh, is actually very interesting. It depends uh, in a very non-trivial way on the momentum uh, along the x direction. Okay. So the, the reason is that this is the case is because if I do glide reflection twice, uh, we end up with a full translation. Okay. So this is the difference between symorphic and non-symorphic symmetries. For symorphic symmetries, point group symmetries, like reflection, if we do it twice, uh, we get back to identity operator. But here, uh, doing the reflection twice, we get a full lattice translation. We know that the eigenvalue associated with the lattice translation operator is actually the uh, e to the i k, or k is a crystal momentum. So this immediately tells us that the uh, eigenvalue of the glide reflection g squared has eigenvalue e to the i k, so the eigenvalue associated with glide itself uh, has to be e to the i k over 2, but it has either plus or minus sign in front. So there are two types of eigenstates. Yes? For now, for now, yes, yes, yeah, for now, yeah, I, that's an excellent point. So if I have a spin four system, then m squared is minus one. So glide squared would be minus e to the i k. Thank you, yeah. Um, okay, so so um, so now you see that uh, because you, when you take the square root of a complex number, there are these two branches uh, that with opposite sign. So this leads to two types of uh, eigenstates. And even more interestingly, if I start with one eigenstate, let's say at k equals zero, where the uh, glide eigenvalue is plus one. And I uh, look at how the bands evolve as a function of momentum k. Uh, after k changes from 0 to 2 pi, once we go, to, uh, go through a cycle in the Brillouin zone, the plus 1 eigenstates would evolve continuously into a minus 1 eigenstates, just because you know, e to that k over 2 uh, changes sign when k goes by 2 pi. Okay? So this leads to the interesting uh, twisted connectivity of bands over the Brillouin zone. Okay, so that uh, uh, the two branches of the uh, of the glide uh, eigenstates they are twisted uh, w over the entire Brillouin zone. So this guarantees that there's there's um, some band crossing uh, in the within the Brillouin zone. Okay, so this band crossing can occur anywhere, but it's guaranteed to happen by this peculiar uh, glide uh, symmetry. That's uh, if, if if the glide is present. So so there are a lot of uh, papers exploring. The uh, consequences of uh, of this glide symmetry, or generally non-symorphic symmetry, uh, in the context of topological insiders, you know, exploring the possibility of topological insiders protected by a glide symmetry, and uh, but all these works uh, require, in order to be topologically non-trivial, all these works require a time rose symmetry to be absent. So that's why it's difficult to realize in real materials. And uh, uh, the breakthrough, recent breakthrough, came uh, from the 
uh, Princeton Group, uh, Andrew Bernovic, and uh, uh, Zhi Jun Wang, uh, Aris, uh, is here, uh, also with uh, Bob Kava. So they identified this material, uh, potassium mercury antimony, as the first uh, realized example of uh, a topological insulator protected by uh, glide reflection symmetry. So this is a crystal structure uh, consisting of basically uh, layers of honeycomb lattice with, uh, with mercury stuffed, with, with potassium st uh, stuffed in between the planes. And, and you see that these are the three spatial symmetries, uh, the inversion symmetry, the reflection symmetry along the z-axis, and also a glide reflection symmetry along the x-axis. So I think this corresponds to translating. If you, if you look at this crystal structure, if we um, do a reflection x to minus x, followed by uh, translation in the z direction, the crystal remains uh, invariant. Right? So this is the, the, the glide reflection symmetry. And if you look at this particular side surface, the 0, 1, 0 surface, and then the surface uh, preserves this glide reflection symmetry. Okay, uh, translation in the x direction followed by reflection in the x direction followed by translation in the z direction. This is a symmetry that's pre present uh, for the surface. And, um, now, um, and, you know, if you want to figure out how uh, these people figure uh, identify the material, you should ask uh, Aris. And uh, uh, to make a long story short, uh, so here is their uh, prediction that um, if you look at the uh, surface brillium zone, the band structure in the surface brillium zone, uh, there will be uh, surface states. And uh, along these uh, uh, green lines uh, connecting high symmetry points uh, in momentum space, you see this kind of a twisted uh, 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 band connectivity. So these are surface states, surface band connectivity. So that uh, you have a non-trivial, uh, uh, if you uh, go around this circle, uh, you, you see that you start from a band uh, one, you end up in the higher energy bands. You know, similar to topology injury, there's a non-trivial uh, uh, surface band connectivity. But the difference is here is that uh, the band connectivity uh, requires the non-symorphic symmetry, and it also requires time rules of symmetry. So I'm, I'm not really explaining why, but uh, but you can you can ask Aris about this. Um, so 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 this leads to uh, you know, from first principle calculations, it leads to um, interesting uh, surface states protected by non-symorphic symmetry and uh, by time rules of symmetry. We need both. Yes. So, so this this is the that is protected by the symmetry. Yeah, this crossing here. So it is, it is, it is, right? It is, it is on Hamstring. Yeah, they are only allowed to uh, lie on this particular line. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's an excellent point. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, all I know is that they, uh, as I'm repeating what I l uh, learned, <laughs> so is that this, this degeneracy is protected by um, uh, both the non symmetric symmetry and time rule symmetry. You need both to ensure this, this two-fold degeneracy here. And, and this is turned out to be important. Yeah. So I think what is happening is that uh, if you do time reversal, you take this momentum k to here. But then uh, reflection symmetry also uh, change kx to minus kx. So if you do a combination of, of uh, time reversal and non-symorphic, these are all double degeneracy. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Excellent, yeah. And why is the, oh, yeah. And, uh, and these are calculations for two um, surface uh, orientations. I mean, the same surface orientation, but with different surface conditions. And, and you see that some of the features uh, change, but in both cases, you are guaranteed to have uh, surface bands uh, with these kind of, uh, they call hourglass type of connectivity, where bands cross each other uh, along this high symmetry line due to the non symorphic symmetry. Yes, Mike? It's gapped. It's, it's gapped, right? Yeah, it's gapped, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, um, um, okay, so, um, yeah, then uh, uh, following this uh, prediction about uh, just uh, two months ago, uh, there's an experimental group uh, from uh, China uh, uh, reporting uh, the observation of the surface states uh, in precisely this compound. Uh, and uh, these are the uh, photo emission uh, results. Uh, and uh, it con uh, agrees uh, well with uh, theoretical uh, prediction. Um, and also just about uh, maybe a few weeks ago, there's also a theoretical paper showing that um, this type of uh, topological insider with non symmetric symmetry can also be understood as stacks of uh, 2D 
time reversal invariant topological insulators. Okay, so, so in these both ca cases, with either reflection symmetry or with glide reflection symmetry, in a theoretical sense, uh, these topological uh, insulators are equivalent to stacks of two-dimensional states. Yes, Rahul? They're similar, yeah, they're similar. So, um, but one need um, one 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 difference is that you know, so so basically, yeah, diff different symmetries in both cases. Uh, the way I will put it is that uh, symmetry enforces that surface to be at a critical point. Um, yeah, the symmetry could be glide symmetry, or it could be just a simple reflection symmetry, or it could be other symmetries. So at, at this level, it's, it's similar. Yeah. I mean, there are features, for example, that are present in the non-small-bit case that's absent in the mirror case. For example, this kind of a, a band connectivity. Um, so, so, so there are differences, and there are similarities. Let, let, let me put it this way. Yes? Yes? It's twice. I mean, it's twice. twice. Yeah. It's twice, you, you can, yeah, I think you can think that way. I, I think, I think you can think, I, I, that's exactly what I think too, yeah. So, so, so I think, so one, one, one thing I, I'm thinking is that if you, I haven't checked this, uh, and Iris probably can, can answer much better than I do, is that if you take a, um, probably one can take a mirror symmetric case, and then weakly break the mirror symmetry, turning into it a, a non-symorphic, uh, this glide reflection symmetry. And then, exactly as you said, that bands fold back. But you still guarantee to have this non-trivial crossing, right? Because the glide reflection symmetry is still present. So that's probably also one way to think about it. Yes, yes. I'm a little confused about the stack of characters. Yeah. Both I think that we can construct topological insulator and enforce characters. We have characters. What? Yes, exactly. So in that sense, it's that like sense, in that case, you cannot. Yeah. You cannot that's obtain. Exactly. In other words, uh, yeah, you know, that's an excellent point. In other words, a time reversal invariant and the mirror symmetric uh, TCI with mirror to number one, that cannot be obtained from stacking. Well, I think this is double two copies of the stack. And then mirror to number two, you can, yes. But if I think of uh, TCI that it's double copies of the dimensional, you still can't. Correct, correct. So, so yeah, I should, I should be more precise. So it's like either. Either the, the examples we know, at least so far, the topological crystalline insiders, either they can also be, um, either they can be obtained by just taking a TIs, but with some additional symmetry, or they can be obtained by multiple copies of TIs, uh, which normally would be trivial, but because of this additional symmetry, they are not. Yeah, let me, let me put it this way. Yeah, that's a, that's a statement. So you know you can couple two copies of the 3D You can couple it on slides. In fourth dimension, you mean? You are, are you talking about 4D system? No, no, or? even 3D. You yeah. couple two copies of the 3D TI in a glide symmetry. I see you're saying in addition to this planar construction, you can, you can, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Oh yeah, I think I think I know what I mean. So one, one thing we know is that uh, actually this can also be understood as taking a um, non-symorphic TI without mirror, without, with glide symmetry but with no time reversal, and then take uh, its uh, product of this state with its time reversal conjugate. Is that is that what I mean? Okay, maybe yeah. Anyway, we can we, yeah. Anyway, that's good. Yeah. Maybe a comment that just sort of answers the question. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, that's sort of the um, the. So if if you have questions, please ask me now because I'm going to switch to. Yes. Well, it's a it's a matter of terminology, but <laughs> I think. But uh, I mean, these these drag cones are can slide along this line. Okay. Maybe that's one way of saying this. Of course, in the mirror TCI case, also the dracone can also slide along the line continuously. Yeah, but anyway. 
But I think, but I think to be fair, I mean, there are non-trivial connectivity. It's kind of a twisting, right? The bands twist across um, the uh, Brillouin zone when momentum of the bounce by two pi. That is, that is special to the non-symmorphic case, right? So this is what I mean by this twisted uh, connectivity here. Right? So they're guaranteed to cross um, by this with this twisting. Yes. We need to break the non-symmorphic uh, glide symmetry or one break uh, time reversal symmetry. Breaking either one of the symmetries can open up gap. Yeah. That's that's very generic. You know, generally, you know, for topological crystal insert, if breaking the crystal symmetry, open up gap. Yes. How? Sorry. Uh, I mean, in this Oh yeah, yeah, that's absolutely correct. One need uh, to look at a surface which preserves this uh, glass reflection symmetry. Surfaces that do not have this symmetry will generally be gapped. That's also a generic feature of uh, topological crystalline insiders. Yeah, one only uh, obtain uh, metallic conducting surface states uh, on high symmetry surfaces. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so now let me move on to the uh, second uh, part of the, of, um, the plan. So this is about um, uh, you know, I'm now completely switching uh, topics. So previously I was talking about uh, uh, symmetry protected topological phases, in particular those protected by crystal symmetries. So those are non-fractionized phases, and they're they're so uh, interesting. Uh, all the interesting properties come from symmetry. And here I'm going to talk about uh, uh, fractionalized topological phases. Uh, and these systems do not require any symmetry, just as Mike Levin has been uh, telling us in the last uh, two days. Um, but one important difference is that I'm going to talk about topological phases, fractional topological phases in fermionic systems. Okay, so there was already um, uh, quite a lot of discussion in Shagang Wen's lecture that bosonic and fermionic systems have different uh, topological classifications. And there's a question, for example, is there a fermionic version of the uh, string net model? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you some examples, some uh, examples of uh, fractionalized topological phases that can be constructed out of Majorana fermions. So, um, so in particular, we have we envision an array of Majorana fermions that are intact with each other by some uh, short-range interactions, and and we ask are there interesting phases uh, out of it? Uh, in two dimensions, I'm going to show you certain models where we have fermionic uh, fractional topological order with uh, anions. These anions are not uh, simple fermions anymore. Uh, in three dimensions, things are even more interesting. We get uh, new kinds of topological order uh, without anions. It has point-like excitations, but they are not anions. They do not satisfy the fractional statistics. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, let me start with uh, just uh, the two-dimensional example. I'm just giving, going to give you some examples. Um, so this is uh, work done with my, my student Saga VJ and former student uh, uh, Tim Shea, who is now in KITP. And a, a particular saga played a, a key role here. So, so we consider a honeycomb a lattice of Majorana fermions. At every site, we have a Majorana fermion. Oh, by the way, um, when I say Majorana fermion in these two, uh, in this lecture and all the rest of lectures, I really take them as just a uh, 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 fermion. Okay. So all the model I'm going to describe can also be rewritten in terms of just electrons. So whenever I want to rewrite the same model in terms of electrons. I just arbitrarily take a pair of, let's say, neighboring Majorana fermions, and I express them in terms of electron operators, C and C dagger. So for example, <coughs> so this is a honeycomb lattice uh, of Majorana fermions. There's gamma 1 and gamma 2. So I can rewrite the whole model. So I'm going to write the model uh, in terms of gamma 1, gamma 2. But one can also rewrite the model in the following way. I can define the fermion operator gamma 1 plus i gamma 2, and fermion uh, annihilation operator and creation operator like this. So then what we have is gamma 1 will become c plus c dagger over 2. Gamma 2 becomes c minus c dagger divided by 2i. So then, instead of having a honeycomb lattice of Majorana fermions, uh, this, will, this rewriting will lead us to a model 
which is um, which is on the triangle lattice, I think. So where each site now uh, we have electrons on these sites, and each site corresponds to a bond. That's uh, in square Thank you. <laughs> so square lattice. It should be right, or it should be. Is it triangle? That should add this. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So that's when you get the idea. Yeah. So in other words, all the model I'm going to write down, even though I write it in terms of my random fermions, these are basically you should think of it as really a fermionic models. Right? Yeah. Yeah. In in in, in these in these pictures, they have the random fermions half degree of freedom. But I can rewrite everything in terms of just electrons, which has a full degree of freedom. And 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 one message is that. Um, it is arbitrary, yeah. But uh, I will show you that the reason that we like to think in terms of Majoranus is because, uh, at least for us, it uh, inspires to get uh, interesting models this way. So for example, you see that um, <coughs> an interaction term, which is easy to write down in terms of Majoranus, becomes very complicated and uh, strange looking when we write in terms of the electron operators. That's that's the motivation, yeah. That's one, one motivation. OK, so, um, so the model uh, here is very simple. It only consists of one type of operator. That is associated with a, a six-side plaquette, uh, the hexagon. So that's what we call these class of models, plaquette models, Majorana plaquette models. So, um, so this operator is just defined by because the algebra of Majorana is very simple. You know, Majorana fermions are self hermitian and the square of Majorana operator is identity. So there are not many interaction terms you can actually write down. So the only type of term you can write down is just product of Majorana fermions over several sites. And here, we take this uh, interaction to be the product of six Majorana fermions on each hexagon. And we add up all these hexagon uh, operators. So this defines the Hamiltonian. Um, uh, so the reason we choose this honeycomb lattice is because in honeycomb lattice, uh, all the uh, neighboring hexagons, they share two Majorana fermions. And as a result, these hexagon operators, they all commute. Now, every two Majorana operators anti commute. But if you have even number of them uh, consisting of different Majorana operators, uh, the, the, the commute. Right? So this, this, is, this uh, particular lattice with this interaction, it guarantees that the Hamiltonian consists of all commuting operators. So it's a solvable Hamiltonian. Uh, the ground state is very simple. Uh, it, uh, for all these hexagon operators, take eigenvalue plus one uh, in the ground state. Uh, however, you know, uh, this ground state, as you can imagine, is actually a highly entangled state uh, of the Majorana fermions, right? because you know, different hexagons they share. Uh, a common uh, overlapping Majorana fermions. Yes? The ground state on the torus has fourfold degeneracy. But we will come to that later. Yeah. Mike, question? OK, all right. So, um, so for excitations, uh, it corresponds to, let's say, certain hexagons with eigenvalue minus 1. So then this creates a uh, localized excitation that's localized on a certain hexagons. So these are ground state and these are the excited states. Now, um, one thing we will notice uh, uh, soon is that these kind of hexagon excitations are very special. They can only be created in pairs. Uh, they cannot be created alone. Yes, question? Thank you. Yeah, that should be nice. Thank you. Yeah, there are six Marinas. Thank you. Yeah, yes. OK, so. Um, OK, so, so let me explain this, why the hexagonal excitations can only come in pairs. Um, so let me, um, uh, for the sake of analysis, uh, let me divide all these hexagons into three types with different colors, A, B, C, and then they repeat themselves. So basically, we, we make the unit cell three times as large. Um, then uh, we see that if we take the property, the reason we choose this coloring is that all if I take the uh, hexagons of all the red color and uh, take the product of these uh, hexagon operators associated with red hexagons, we will cover all the lattice sites. So in other words, the product of hexagon operators on all red hexagons uh, is equal to the product of all Majorana fermions uh, in the entire system. And the same is obtained The same is obtained by the product of all the B type of hexagon operators uh, or the C type of hexagon operators. Okay. And the product of all fermion operators in the system is equal to the fermion parity. And all fundamental uh, interactions in the system has to preserve 
the fermion parity? Is it just a fundamental process of nature? Yes? Yeah, the, the, you, you, yeah, you one can define some ordering, and I'm not being very particularly, uh, so let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. So for each hexagon, I can start, for each hexagon, for example, I can start like this. Yeah, 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 okay, you can, yeah. Okay, um, so, okay, so, so, um, so as we said, that the taking the product of all uh, hexagons of each color uh, will get, give us the fermion parity in the entire system, and all possible operators that you can add to the system has to preserve this uh, fermion parity. So this immediately implies that I can never uh, change the uh, uh, eigenvalue of a hexagon operator uh, on just one hexagon, because the product has to be, let's say, equal to plus one. If I change just one hexagon, I get minus one. That's not allowed, because the fermion parity has to be conserved uh, in the entire system. Right? So this, uh, yes? So which, which part? The, I'm dividing it this way so, so that the product of all the uh, hexagon operators associated with each color uh, cover the entire lattice. So, so, so you know, this is A, and this is another A hexagon. This is yet another A hexagon. So if I take all the hexagon operators, uh, I just get the product of all my fermion operators in the entire system. Yeah, is there, is there a question? Yeah. Uh, I think it's easy actually to just look at the Majorana fermion. Uh, it's really just easier. Yeah, I mean, yeah. All I'm saying is a very simple fact that, that I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm going to use this fact. But this fact itself is very, really simple. It's just that, uh, literally, right? If you if you take all the eight hexagons, you see that it covers all the lattice site, every lattice site on the Huntington lattice, and, and 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 the same will be obtained if you take the the product of the hexagon operators for all the beast uh, hexagons. Okay. Yeah, for now, let me just work with infinite system size. But yeah, we can talk about that later. But yeah. OK. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I'm being sloppy here. <laughs> OK. All right, so, um, okay, so, so, so the, the fact that uh, uh, the product of all these uh, hexagon operators of a given type is equal to the fermion parity, and the fermion parity cannot be flipped uh, by, by any process, this immediately implies I cannot just flip one hexagon by itself because that would uh, uh, change the total fermion parity, which is not allowed. And this immediately tells us that uh, hexagon excitations has to come in pairs. We can create you know, two AA excitations, or two BB excitations, or two CC excitations. But we can never create each type of excitation um, you know, by itself, by, by, by one. Hexagon excitations of each type has to be created in pairs. So this already uh, suggests uh, hints that these uh, exon, uh, these hexagon excitations are not a trivial particle. Uh, you know, um, trivial particles, by definition, are what can be created by local operators. Here, they cannot. They have to be created in pairs. It suggests already that they are annuals with non-trivial topological uh, braiding properties. So now let's look at uh, the braiding statistics of these um, uh, hexagon excitations. So um, as you heard from uh, Mike Levin, uh, in the previous lecture, in order to define braiding, we need to uh, use a string operator that drag these uh, hexagons around other particles, or you know, exchange two hexagons of the same type. So for that, I need to define a string operator which actually moves these hexagons. So this is defined as here. So suppose I want to uh, move this uh, hexagon uh, excitation uh, in this blue color. Uh, this string operator, any product of my fermions on a string that ends at one point on this blue hexagon. Uh, the, the string operator and this hexagon operator, which share one site, uh, they would anti-commute with each other. Because uh, if I have a product of my fermions, they anti-commute if they share an a odd number of my fermions. So from this simple algebra, you see that this uh, hexagon operator and this particular string operator uh, anti-commute. 
So what this anti-commutation relation means is that if I act this uh, string operator on the ground state of the system, uh, it will create a, a hexagon flip, a hexagon excitation. Or alternatively, if there's already a hexagon flip excitation uh, sitting here, acting this string operator would annihilate it and move it to the other ends. Okay. So basically, um, these uh, uh, string operators uh, would create uh, two hexagon excitations of the same type at its two ends. Okay. So now, having defined the string operator, yes. No, it has to be even because uh, you cannot. Um, any physical operator has to involve, has to conserve Fermi parity. Always contain even number of sides. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And as you, as you see, that the 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 fundamental fact that the Fermi parity is conserved plays a very very important role in both this model and the analysis of this model. Uh, so so later I'll, I'll describe that why the particular topological order that we uh, are going to see is only possible in the fermion system. Okay, so now we can uh, talk about statistics, and, and, and this is already uh, discussed in Mac Levin's lecture. Let me repeat it again, this kind of general uh, idea, how to determine statistics. Um, so suppose I have two uh, high stone excitations, uh, in both of the same type, A and A. We want to uh, exchange these two uh, hexagon excitations by moving this first excitation A from here to here, then the second excitation from here to here, and finally uh, from here to here. So in, in this particular way, that move first here, here, and here. Right? This, this does an exchange process. Um, and the motion of these, uh, uh, each hexagon excitation uh, is generated by the string operator, for example, W1. Okay? followed by W0, then followed by W2. W1, W0, W2 does an uh, exchange process. And so we would like to ask, you know, what's its effect acting on the ground state? Uh, uh, as already emphasized previously, that in order to um, determine the statistics, we also have to cons compare this exchange process versus another process where we only drag a single excitation around the same path. So that is... Uh, obtained by another sequence of these string operators, W1, W2, then W0. Right? Exchange process and a single anion uh, 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 motion are described by the same set of operators, but in different orderings. Okay? And now you see that all these three string operators, W0, W1, W2, uh, they involve different Marana operators, so they all commute with each other. And that's why uh, the uh, it doesn't matter in what sequence you do this operation. So this basically implies that after braiding two uh, hexagon excitations of the same type, uh, you get the same effect as just moving the single axial anion uh, around the same path. We don't get any additional phase factor. This implies that these uh, anion excitations, a single plaquette flip, is actually a boson. Okay, doesn't look particularly interesting. Um, Things are more interesting. So the self-statistics of these hexagon excitations are bosons. So now let me uh, uh, describe mutual statistics. As we said, there are three types of uh, hexagons. So we can drag one uh, hexagon of A type around another hexagon of B type, come back. Okay. So if we do this, um, we use this sequence of uh, string operators uh, you know, all the way from W gamma 1 all the way up to gamma 12, right? And, uh, you know, we can do these three steps here. You know, first using this operator, this first string operator, then second string operator, then the third. Now, if you look at this string operator, uh, interestingly, you can rewrite the string operator as a product of uh, hexagon operators that are enclosed uh, within this path, within this closed path. This is, again, just uh, identity, uh, just a simple identity. For example, if you take a product of uh, O1, O2, O3, then followed by OB, all these um, uh, Marana fermions that are in the middle cancel out. Because every time you have a product of two Marana operators, the same two Marana operators twice, you get identity. Right? So, so that's why you take the product of all these Marana plaquettes inside this region, uh, the interior uh, cancels out. You're only left with this 
closed string operator on the boundary, which is what we want. Um, but the important thing is that uh, now you can compare two processes where, for example, you drag this uh, anion along this path without a B excitation inside, uh, compare that process with a process where you drag the anion A uh, along the same path, but with a B excitation inside. So with or without the B excitation, the hexagon operator OB uh, take opposite eigenvalues, plus 1 in the first case, minus 1 in the second case. So this immediately tells us that depending on whether the B anion is present or not, uh, this uh, process has different uh, phase factor, differ by minus 1. Okay. And this implies immediately that the A and B anions, they have pi mutual statistics. So explicitly shown here that uh, dragging A around another anion give you additional sign. Yes? No, 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 forget about this B string operator. No, anions are defined, you know, anions themselves, are doesn't, you know, the string operator is used just to create these anions. So I, I shouldn't draw these strings here at all. Yeah, it's just, yeah. All right. Okay, so now one can actually um, do the same analysis, uh, you know, go through a tedious uh, uh, procedure. Uh, so, so let me just label, let me just uh, show you the uh, table that, that there are in total eight different excitations. Uh, trivial excitation, you know, for example, you just uh, add a physical fermion to the system. Uh, sorry, trivial excitation is, you know, so for example, like a bilinear Majorana operator creates a pair of uh, of anions at the same time. Uh, trivial excitations, there are these A, B, C, the three types of uh, single plaquette flips, uh, or you can combine them. For example, if you have two excitations neighbor, uh, nearby, A and B, or B, C, and A, C, or you can uh, have uh, three plaquettes all sitting together, A, B, C. So these are the uh, all possible uh, point-like excitations in the system. Uh, the diagonal line here tells us about the self-statistics. So for example, A, B, C are bosons. Uh, these are this, this A, B, B, C, A, C. These are fermions. Uh, this A, B, C is also a fermion. Okay. Uh, and then the off-diagonal matrix elements here tells us the mutual statistics. For example, if we move A around B, we get minus one sign. So they have high mutual statistics. So. Um, so let me just summarize the results here. That ABC, these anions are self bosons, but they have pi mutual statistics with respect to each other. The ABBC, AC, these uh, excitations are fermions. These are not the physical fermions. These are uh, something like the epsilon particle in the toric code. These are uh, emergent fermions. So they have uh, self statistics of fermion particle, but they also have mutual statistics with other excitations. So these are really uh, anions. And then the last one, ABC is actually a physical fermion, because if I add electron to the system, uh, the, Majorana, uh, the electron operator can be uh, uh, obtained by acting the Majorana operator, right? because Majorana operator has a linear overlap with the physical electron creation operator. So a Majorana op operator would flip three uh, plaquettes. So that's why the ABC uh, excitations is a physical fermion. Okay? So this physical fermion has no non-trivial statistics with any other particles. Okay, while these emergent fermions have uh, non-trivial statistics with other particles. In one case, A, B, B, C, A, C, these are anions, but A, B, C is a physical fermion. Okay, so we have found that eight types of quasi-particles, and I'm not really showing this, but if you uh, look at the uh, degeneracy on the torus with fourfold degeneracy, so there's a mismatch. They differ by a factor of two. You know, this is something that's not possible in a bosonic topological system. In a topological order state built out of bosons or spins, uh, the total number of quasi particles has to be equal to the ground degeneracy on the torus. And here we see a factor of two mismatch. So this is actually unique to topological order in the Fermi system. So basically, uh, in any uh, fermion system, uh, the physical fermion okay, should be counted as one quasi particle. And, 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 and that's why uh, there's this factor of two difference. Um, now, so you can ask, what is the topological order of the system? You know, is this is this something that uh, that we 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 know something about? Actually, uh, this uh, model, uh, this topological order in the fermion system, uh, has a hidden relation to what have been already discussed like eight times already in lecture toric code. Okay, so th what <laughs> basically this model is is topologically equivalent to a toric code uh, in the fermion system. So let me um, uh, show you um, this connection in two ways. First, I'm going to start with this model, this fermionic model. 
And let me imagine I, uh, I make the energy cost of flipping one type of uh, excitation, for example, on the A plaquette, to be sufficiently high. So I project out the Hilbert space containing uh, uh, hexagon flips on these A hexagons. Okay. So then uh, another way, of, uh, another way of doing this is to say, uh, if if the uh, energy cost of flipping an A per cat is uh, infinitely high, then effectively we can project the system into a uh, low energy subspace where the fermion parity on the A hexagon is fixed. The product of six minor operators is set to be one for all states in the low energy Hilbert space. Okay. So once we do that, uh, you see that basically uh, we should replace each uh, A hexagon by a single site. And this single site would have a Hilbert space of dimension uh, 4. Right? We have, we have in total 6 minor fermions that give you 2 to the 3, which is 8 dimensional Hilbert space. After I fix the fermion parity due to this uh, infinite high energy cost, uh, we are left with a 4 dimensional Hilbert space uh, on every effective site. And this four-dimensional Hilbert space are purely bosonic. Okay, so then in that limit, one can rewrite this uh, model in terms of uh, this uh, effective four-dimensional spin at every site. So that gives us a bosonic model. And in that bosonic model, there will be only uh, four types of excitations. We will have a uh, trivial particle, A excitation, C excitation, but all excitations involving uh, a hexon flip B is now removed. We have a uh, trivial particle A, uh, trivial particle, uh, we, we set A excitation to be infinite high energy. So we have trivial particle A uh, identity, B, C, and uh, A, C, right? And two of them, uh, B and C, are bosons. And the third one, uh, which is B, C, are uh, fermions. So this is give us back the E, M, and epsilon particle uh, in particle. Okay. So once I basically, um, uh, project the fermion flip excitations, we recover uh, a particle model, uh, something equivalent to the particle model. Yes? So, emergent fermion has non trivial statistics with other particles, so it's an anion. You know, it has self statistics of the fermion, but it's an anion because it has non trivial gradient statistics with other particles. Whereas a physical fermion, it, 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 it doesn't, by definition, physical fermions. Uh, it's a uh, yeah. I don't think you can use the same language for the bosonic system to describe topological order in the fermion system, or it requires some modification. I don't know, Shagan will 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 you be talking about that. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, that's exactly. The, I said I was going to explain two ways. I just now explained how you start with the fermion model. model. Uh, you project uh, out all fermion flip, flip flipping excitations. You recover a boson model that is toric code. Alternatively, you can take a boson toric code model, and you add a physical fermion to it. So after all, you know, in the toric code, it's built out of spins. Spins are made of electrons, right? So you can imagine that uh, the, you add some uh, some charge fluctuations, allow some fermions at high energy to hop around. So then we have a fermion system. And in that fermion system, you can attach physical fermion to every uh, excitation, you know, trivial particle E, M, epsilon. And then you get uh, twice as many excitations. Okay. Yes? Yeah, I, I, I almost never use that matrix. So, so OK, sorry. All right, so OK. Yeah. It's always it's always true. Okay, 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 great. Yeah. Okay. Now, but one thing. Okay, I've described now the, in terms of topological order. So uh, this system is equivalent to Tauri code added with some physical fermions. However, you can see that uh, it's very unnatural to think that way because there's interesting symmetry fractionalization that's only possible in the Fermi system. Okay, what I mean is the following. If you look at all these uh, three plaquettes, A, B, C, they are uh, related by crystal symmetries. They are all um, essentially equivalent, right? Uh, um, you know, if we you know, by hand demand that the A uh, hexagon has infinite high energy cost of flipping it, that already breaks lattice symmetry. So in the presence of lattice symmetries, uh, it's much more natural to just 
uh, think of the system as having eight types of uh, particle excitations. Um, a formal way of saying this is that uh, lattice symmetry actually can permute different hexagons, and by doing that, it uh, permutes the different types of anions. So A, B, C are three types of anions. Uh, for example, under translation symmetry along this direction, A is turned into B, okay, and B turned into C, etc. So lattice symmetry acts as a non-trivial uh, symmetry fractionalization, has a non-trivial symmetry fractionalization pattern that you heard from Xie Chen probably in boson systems, and and it, and, we, and and this shows that in this simple model, uh, it's very explicitly uh, present, and also this symmetry fractionalization is permutes anion types. Okay. Another sort of a byproduct of this uh, toy model is the following. That in a bosonic system, uh, if we look at, as I described, if I take the excitations that does not involve A anion, we have uh, 1, B, C, and uh, 1, B, C, and B, C. These four excitations, uh, they form the topological order of a Z2Gh theory or Tori code. But alternatively, I can look at another way. Uh, I can take uh, a trivial A, B, C, and uh, uh, I forgot. No, uh, there's another way of taking. Uh, I think taking. No, I'm sorry. Here, okay. If I take this trivial particle A B B C A C, uh, A B B C A C are all fermions, right? So if I take this subset, uh, what I get is so-called in the bosonian system is a SO8 level one topological order, okay, uh, so-called three fermion topological order, okay? So in the bosonian system, Z2 topological order and SO8 level 1, three fermion topological order are distinct. Okay? But now you see that uh, in the fermionic system, when physical fermions are present, uh, they all be, will be enlarged into having uh, four, uh, twice as many particles. We have eight type of quality particles, and that's completely equivalent. Okay, so in the fermionic system, the Z2 topological order and SO8 level 1 topological order are equivalent. Okay? So this sort of, all this shows Topological order in the Fermi system uh, is, uh, has, a, has a, some difference uh, with topological order in the boson system. Okay. Yes? So they have the same statistics. So if I take um, 1, A, B, B, C, A, C, uh, they, their self statistics and mutual statistics are exactly the same as so called SOA level 1. Uh, I'm not really explaining this, but um, you can just. Uh, so why is that Oh, it's because once I, um, in this model, right? So another way of saying this, in the, maybe let me put it this way. You take this SO8 uh, level 1 bosonic topological order, you add a physical fermion to it, uh, then you will get eight type of quality particles with exactly the same statistics as it here. Okay. So in other words, I can, you know, if I want to think of this system as a boson system attached to a fermion, there are multiple ways of doing this. I can take, you know, 1, B, C, and B, C, and regard the other four type of particles as obtained from these four, combined with physical fermions. Or I can take another set of four quasi-particles, one uh, A, B, B, C, A, C, as the defining anions, and then attach a physical fermion to them. The two uh, uh, procedures uh, give me the same uh, table of statistics. So this tells us that this, they are equivalent. Yeah, this is It's uh, even more than projective, right? And remember, Xie Shen talked about yes. that, uh, that um, there are projective representations, but here, it actually interchange anion type. That is symmetry, interchange anion type. Yeah, but, but then if you also consider the projective, I mean, because the projective part comes from the idea of split extension. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know whether, you know, so maybe what you're asking is, you know, suppose there's some lattice symmetry which do not change anion type. It still keep A to A, B to B, C to C. And then you can ask, is the uh, is, uh, symmetry realized projectively or not? Is that the question? Yeah, for example, if I take three, four rotation, right? Twice, twice, uh, thrice, uh, do I get some anion? I think, that's I think it depends on the background flux. Yeah. 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 So you know, like, like what Shetan talked about, whether the sign in the interaction term is positive or negative, we get different yeah. answers. I think the same happens here. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Yeah, there is a, uh, well, let's see. I think there is a way of implementing time rules. So I haven't thought whether, um, yeah, I, the, there, is a, there is a way of defining time rules as a global symmetry. I haven't thought whether time rules is realized projectively or not. That's a good question. After 
after I interchange one. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, so yeah, maybe yeah, maybe we are asking because of this. Uh, I think it's known that in the bosonic system, SOA level one has to be a chiral state, whereas Z two topology is non chiral. You know how they are possibly equivalent. I think well, I'm saying that they are equivalent at the level of braiding statistics. So you may need to have to add some sort of a short range entangled states like uh, chiral states in order to cancel the chirality part. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. So so as you see, you know, basically, you know, with such a simple model uh, in the Fermi system, it has many many features that are uh, surprising uh, for bosonic systems. All right. So um, so now let me. Uh, uh, how much I have, how much time do I have? Twenty minutes. Okay. All right. So yeah, let me now um, describe sort of uh, some other motivations for thinking about uh, this type of models in the Marana fermion system. Um, this is sort of from point of view of uh, uh, quantum uh, computation. Um, so you may have heard a lot about like topological quantum computation uh, using non-abelian anions, and you may have heard that uh, the Marana zero modes, uh, if you braid them, they have non-abelian uh, statistics. Um, so that has inspired a lot of uh, um, uh, ideas using Mariana fermions for quantum computation. Um, but it, actually, if you look at more uh, carefully, uh, there are some uh, some important uh, uh, issues that needs to be addressed. And uh, and think right now the community has started to think more about these these issues. Um, so so if we um, for example if we take a topological order system uh, with you know, abelian or non-abelian annual accessions. And we use braiding to um, as an unitary evolution. Uh, so the question is, can this be a good platform for quantum computation? Okay. Um, there are some uh, serious issues um, due to the presence of uh, mobile excitations at finite temperature. Okay. So, um, so if we uh, go to you know, the lowest temperature that's available in the uh, fridge, and we, if we increase the system size, suppose we are thinking about large-scale quantum computation. Then the number of thermally excited excitation uh, goes like this. There is an exponential suppression due to the presence of energy gap divided by KBT. However, uh, at a fixed temperature, as the system size increases, the number of thermally excited anions uh, also increases. Okay. So in the uh, thermodynamic limit or in the, in the limit of large system size, there's always some thermally excited excitations, and these uh, excitations can do unwanted braiding with the anions you use to store quantum information. And as this kind of unwanted braiding uh, causes errors. So what I'm saying is that suppose you have two Mariana modes. Let's say more, more, maybe better way. Suppose you have two Fibonacci anions. Let's say suppose we can engineer such a system. Then as we can encode information in these uh, non-abelian Fibonacci anions. Let's say for example these two or or, or these three uh, form a topologically protected qubit. But then at finite temperatures there are additional. Uh, thermally excited anions present. And so these mobile anions can move around an, uh, a, an, uh, an anion that you use to install qubits. And this kind of braiding will change the quantum state, uh, change the qubit state in a way that uh, you are not aware of. So this is caused problems. It's called uh, error correction. So this was sort of known for a long time in the quantum information community. And uh, recently, the Nest Matter community began to, uh, to, to Seriously, think about these issues. Yes? No, this is a gap system. We're talking about a gap system. Uh, you know, topological order states have an energy gap. So this EG is an energy gap. No, no, no. For in the bending suitor, for example, right? In the bending suitor, the uh, particle excitations, right? You know, excitations also has this statistics. Yeah. It's just yeah. Boltzmann distribution. But it's the same. It's the same. I mean, if you think about in the, in the limit where temperature is small, yeah. if you look at the um, the density of anions, it's it's just given by this. This is exact. This is really exact. Yeah. You know, in the limit where you have only a uh, low temperature and a uh, very uh, small density of anions. This is, this is correct. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, um, so this is a problem, okay, that uh, uh, if we um, uh, stay at a, a given temperature, but we, if we uh, increase the system size for the purpose of large scale quantum computation, uh, you know, you know, having a non abelian state and braiding non abelian anions is not enough. 
uh, due to these um, these uh, these quantum errors. So um, so in the quantum information community, that uh, the the theorists have uh, thought about this issue a long time ago, and the solution they come up with is quantum error correction. Okay, so up to now, I think it's fair to say that that all the reliable quantum computation scheme we know of uh, requires error correction. Okay, and uh, error correction is a uh, 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 you know, for quantum error correction, it's 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 uh, very different from classical errors. In the classical uh, bit, it's either zero or one. So um, to correct errors, we can encode information in a redundant way. Let's say um, you have uh, three classical bits. Uh, if two of them are zero, we take the uh, the encoded qubits as zero. Uh, so even if you have a third one being an error, this majority rule is enough to correct errors. But um, for quantum computation. Uh, we know that a qubit, a quantum bit, can be in a superposition between 0 and 1. And so that's why there are two types of errors. A bit flip error, uh, flipping of spin from up to down, or there's something called phase error, that if we are in a superposition between 0 and 1, uh, the phase can jump by pi, for example. And this phase error uh, requires additional procedure uh, to correct. And in fact, if we only have a single uh, qubit, a single uh, uh, qubit, there's no way to simultaneously correct all types of errors. Because the time you measure uh, the, whether the qubit is in 0 or 1, you project, you project this qubit to a definite state. You lose the quantum coherence. Right? So that's what profound challenge, so-called, that uh, uh, we need to correct errors without actually disturbing the, the qubit itself. Okay? So the, the scheme that, uh, um, that the quantum information community have come up with is to basically encode uh, qubits uh, not in, in encoding information, not in a single physical qubits, but envisioning a entangled states of many physical qubits, and using these entangled states to encode information. So in other words, we build a logical qubits out of many, many physical qubits. And, and on top of that, uh, that the quantum information community has the idea that errors in the logical qubits can be corrected. Okay. Okay. So now we are um, now uh, uh, trying to uh, take this philosophy and think about how to use um, uh, this approach for uh, quantum computation with error crashing uh, based on a Mariana fermion system. Okay. And um, so now, um, so this, uh, so one of the, um, actually the one of the uh, leading platforms in uh, quantum information community for error crashing is the so-called uh, surface code. It's basically um, uh, a variant of the Tori code model that uh, that has been discussed uh, so often. And um, so as I described that this Mariana fermion model uh, actually share many similar properties as a Z2 topology order state. So that's why it's natural uh, to build a Mariana fermion surface code uh, in this system. So let me um, describe how this error correction works uh, in this uh, system. And uh, I think the, the general idea of the surface code actually is, uh, to, to me is actually quite, uh, uh, quite interesting. So you know, sort of the question um, is the following: If we have a non-abelian state, we can encode information uh, in the topological degeneracy in the presence of these non-abelian anions. But Tori code, you know, is actually a abelian topological order state, so anions does not have any internal degrees of freedom. So how to um, make use of it for the purpose of quantum computation? Right. So the initial sort of uh, uh, idea by Alex Kataev is to use Tori code as a quantum memory. Okay. But later, there's ingenious proposals by, uh, I'll show reference later, uh, by um, uh, Rosendorf, and uh, sort of extended the uh, surface code from a quantum memory to an uh, actual architecture for quantum computation with error correction. Okay. So I'm, I'm following that approach here, uh, changing surface code in a boson system to Mariana fermion surface code. Um, okay. um, so, so the idea is the following, that um, if we set the uh, interaction, uh, the term in the Hamiltonian to be zero on certain hexagons, that essentially creates a hole. Basically, initially there's an energy penalty for flipping so all hexagons, any of the hexagons. But for now, let me imagine that I turning off the energy penalty on certain hexagons, that effectively create a hole. And then in that case, the hexagon uh, eigenvalue can either be plus one or minus one. They are now energetically degenerate, and that defines a logical qubit. So in other words, in, uh, the logical qubit is not encoded in uh, internal state of non-abelian anions, but it is encoded in the presence or absence of abelian anions uh, in this kind of surface code uh, platform. And the presence or absence of an anion uh, in a given region defines a um, logical qubit. Um, 
So, and in this case, if the Z operator, okay, uh, which the product of the all Mara fermions around this hexagon, that monitors whether uh, the hexagon eigenvalue is plus one or minus one. So this is the logical Z operator. And then a string operator that ends on this hexagon, it anti-commutes with this hexagon uh, operator. So it, it flips between uh, the logical qubit being uh, zero or one. So this is like a logical X operator. The string operator acts as X gates, and the hexagon operator acts as a logical Z gates. So it's like sigma Z and sigma X for a spin. Now, why error crashing is possible? Uh, this is because, uh, again, it comes back to this important uh, property that uh, at a finite temperature, we may have some thermally excited uh, uh, hexagon flips in the system, and these hexagon flips can be mobile. But again, the fundamental fermion parity conservation tells us all the hexagon flips comes in pairs. Okay, so then um, what uh, can be done is following. Uh, one constantly monitors all the uh, hexagon eigenvalues uh, in the entire system, except in the few logical qubits, uh, the few holes that you are interested in. The, you know, these are these are the holes we use to encode logical qubits. So we measure all hexagon eigenvalues except in these holes. And if we find that in regions uh, near this hole, there is an odd number of hexagon flip. This immediately implies that the hexagon uh, in this hole has also been flipped. So, for example, if I have a bilinear Majorana operator gamma one, gamma two, uh, this uh, if this operator acts on the system, it creates two hexagon flips, one inside uh, the hole, one outside the hole. So, if we find that there is an odd number of these uh, hexagon flips outside the hole, uh, we can infer uh, that a hexagon flip has already occurred. So this is a general idea of error crashing. You know, basically, we detect the errors without actually disturbing, without actually measuring the logical qubit itself. Okay? Because the logical qubits uh, is encoded in a highly entangled state of many physical qubits, and because that uh, this particular Z2 topological order guarantees that the uh, anion excitations come in pairs, we just uh, watch uh, regions, uh, monitor regions near this uh, logical qubits, and every time we find an odd number of Excitations, we know that uh, error has occurred. Yes? You're not uh, you're not um, destroying the braiding properties because um, I'm not going to talk about it. But uh, the, all the braiding operations, for example, they um, they do not flip the uh, hexagons in other regions. You know, for example, if you look at this braiding, uh, you know, braiding can be achieved by this string operator, right? That uh, moves these hexagons. Uh, this string operator commutes with all uh, hexagons everywhere else except the two ending points. Because they commute, I think because they commute, they don't they don't decode here. Yeah, we can we can we can talk about that. Yeah, I'm not going to yeah I'm not going to spend. But there is a you know in the service code scheme there is a in addition to error crashing there are ways of doing uh, braiding and doing other logical gate operations. Yeah. But here I'm just giving you the um, the idea of uh, error crashing. The fact that because we are in the Z2 topology order states, uh, anions uh, come in pairs. So if we find an odd number of anion. Uh, uh, in outside the logical qubits, we know that an anion has popped up in the hole, and that means that there's a bit flip uh, in this hole, in this logical qubit. And likewise, we also monitor uh, the string operator here, and uh, this string operator sort of uh, is important for the superposition between the two logical qubits, 0 and 1. So if there's an uh, odd number of uh, anions crossing this uh, string operator, this string, we can infer that a phase error has occurred. Okay, because for example, if you look at the product of gamma, these two Majorana bilinear operators, it has the effect of creating these two uh, anion excitations, and at the same time, 
it will act as an x operator for these logical qubits. It will, you know, it does a, a it, it it causes a phase uh, flip for this logical qubit, and it can monitor it by finding that there's an odd number of uh, high clung flips showing up below this string in the region that's below this string. That's a general idea. Okay. So let me just uh, uh, summarize that to know. Because of the hexagon flips coming in pairs, both the bit flip error and the phase flip error in the logical qubits can be inferred by measuring the uh, hexagon uh, eigenvalues in regions uh, near the logical qubits. But we never directly measure the uh, logical qubit itself. So this can be called you know, detecting without disturbing. Okay. So, um, so, so this is basically a very general idea. And uh, in the case of the surface code, it was uh, really uh, worked out in all details by uh, Rosendorf. Uh, and uh, it was um, my understanding that the superconducting qubit community is actually pursuing the surface code, like John Martinez, uh, for uh, quantum uh, information processing, so the leading platform for error correction. So this Mariana Fermion surface code it sort of follows the same spirit. Yes? So first, forget about these uh, these blue ones. Uh, yeah. Just look at the red ones. These are just logical qubits. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm saying like it's like uh, Yeah. Actually, that's an excellent question. So um, so so if you change the energetic in the system, it basically affects the error rate, right? It basically affects the error rate. Uh, but it won't still need the error correction in the certain time limit because, because if you want large scale quantum computation over a long enough time, even if the initial error rate is small, because it can occur anywhere in the system at any instant of time, it builds up. So that's why we still need uh, error correction. But you're absolutely right. Uh, for all error correction to be possible, you need the bare uh, error, uh, uh, error rate is sufficiently small so that you know, during the measurement process, you can still keep track of individual error events. If errors occur so frequently that you know faster than the measurement time scale, then none of this can work. That's the general, the general um, requirement for error correction. You need uh, the physical qubits to have a uh, long enough lifetime. You need uh, the uh, errors at the level of physical qubit to be sufficiently slow, slower than the measurement time for all this to be possible. Yeah. OK, so uh, let me now, just very, in the last few minutes, uh, uh, explain why we, we, we think that using Mariana fermions instead of physical uh, spins to build a, um, such a, a surface code, uh, it, it may, perhaps, may have some, some advantage. Um, so if you look at um, either the Mariana fermion surface code or the conventional uh, spin-based surface code, uh, you always need a multi-body interaction okay, to achieve this kind of uh, entangled uh, states, highly entangled states. And the question is, how do you get, you know, in a physical system, the dominant interaction would be two-body interaction. So how do we get multi-body interaction without generating two-body interaction? So this is where uh, Mariana fermions uh, play some uh, interesting role. So, so if we have a uh, mesoscopic superconductor with finite charging energy, and if the superconductor is topological, it will have uh, a Mariana fermions on it. Uh, for example, in this uh, cross geometry of nanowires, uh, you know, each end of the wire, there's a Mariana fermion on it. Okay. Now, the Mariana being a fractional degree of freedom has the following property, that if you take the product of all Mariana fermions in the system, uh, that is equal to the electron number parity in the system. So you, if you add an extra electron into these Mariana zero modes, you, you flip the Mariana qubit, the total parity of the Mariana fermion qubit, and at the same time, you change the electron number parity. So there's a hidden relation between the, uh, the product of Mariana fermions and the electron number parity. So this all I'm saying is that it's the same as saying that if you take a closed, uh, let's say, uh, new equal one third Laughlin state, and if you add up all the charges of the uh, one third Laughlin quasi particle, it has to be an integer. So they are constrained in a global way. So the same happens here that if you fix the total number of electrons in the isolated topological matter, then the product of all the Mariana degrees of freedom is fixed. Okay. So, so then if we have a, uh, if the matter is of mesoscopic size, uh, the total energy of the sumatic islands uh, will depend on the total number of electrons on it. So you, when you add an extra electron to the sumatic, uh, it costs an additional energy. So this is called the single electron charging energy. Okay, when the system is sufficiently small, uh, charging energy becomes, uh, becomes important. 
So this actually immediately gives us a way of coupling all the Majorana fermions far apart from each other, uh, um, because uh, because you know states with different total number of electrons have different energy due to the charging effects. This immediately implies that the total Majorana fermion uh, parity being even or odd would generally have different energy, and one can tune that energy by by a gate voltage. So I'm, I'm not going into the details. You may have heard a little bit about this from Felix Van Oppen's lecture. So basically. Uh, if we have a mesoscopic swing matter, uh, when the Majoranas are still sufficiently far apart so that there's no wave function overlap, and yet the entire system is also sufficiently small so that charging energy are still important, then the charging energy directly translates into a highly non-local operator, which is given by the product of all Majorana fermions. Okay? You, you, you can. In other words, charging energy directly implements this, this multi-body interaction between Majoranas at, at one time, you know, simultaneously. If you tune to the charge degeneracy point, then this U is zero, right? Because at the charge degeneracy point. Yeah, I actually, yeah, I, what I, yeah. yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. What happens is that uh, when charging energy is dominating, the, there's a the lowest energy state, which has, let's say, total electron number, let's say, 100. The first excited has, let's say, um, 100 plus 1. Those are the two states I'm going to use. That's the effect I'm going to use, exactly, yeah, exactly, thanks. Okay, so um, so with this, uh, then one can actually build this kind of uh, um, uh, Majorana surface code. For example, um, uh, let's. So I'm, I'm using a slightly different geometry, but it's really the same as the honeycomb. For example, if I have the topology of the islands, these are labeled by these squares. The charging energy would uh, immediately give us the four-body interaction between uh, these four Majoranas uh, on the boundary. Uh, so the four-body interaction is already uh, implemented. But then there's an additional eight-body interaction you know, on these two additional plaquettes that's uh, needed to build this uh, surface code. And, and those actually can be obtained by just a um, high-order process in the single electron tunneling. So imagine that, that I have an electron uh, on this island that tunnels to this neighboring uh, surmounting islands. So anytime an electron uh, tunnels, uh, I change the total charge on these two islands. So that's energetically uh, unfavored. So in order to come back to the low energy subspace, we need to have high order perturbation. Electron hops from this island to here, to here, to here, and come back. Right? So all these four uh, tunneling events, it will uh, give us a product of all these eight Majorana operators. Okay? So this is why, uh, you know, using a fourth order perturbation theory, we can generate the eight body interaction on the B and C type of uh, plaquettes. Okay? So basically, charging energy gives us a four body interaction, and the perturbation theory in electron tunneling uh, give us the remaining uh, eight body interaction. So that can uh, implement, at least in principle, this, um, this commuting Hamiltonian at least to this Mariner surface code. And actually recently there's a, a very detailed proposals uh, based on uh, nanowire networks and how this um, may perhaps uh, be experimentally realized. Okay. Uh, so I think that's, that's it. So, um, well, next time I'll um, move from two to three dimensions and can talk about uh, topological order states uh, with, without anions uh, in uh, Majorana systems. Again, a real Majorana fermions, but in 3D. Okay, thanks. Yes? You mean to move? Chiral version. Um, I mean, there's certainly you know we know chiral fermionic systems, right? Like fractional quantum Hall states. These are fermion systems, and they are chiral. Um, but I guess your question is, you know, are there interesting new kind of chiral phases that one can construct out of Majorana fermions? I mean, my you know. I think I think it for, I think it's not possible. I, my guess is that uh, it's not possible to get a chiral phase out of commuting Hamiltonians. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's. Okay. Uh,
going to say. Thanks. So I'm actually recall something now. Yeah. KGSP. It is in fact stacked on testing hall, but it's coupled with light symmetry. So it's stacked two D columns. Yeah. Coupled with light symmetry. Coupled. So coupled in light symmetry. Uh huh. So yeah. You can really think of them as some monolayers of. Uh, so stack each one